Good morning. Welcome to church here in Whitehead. Well, it was a lovely, I was about to say summer, early autumn um, Sunday morning. You're so welcome as we come to worship God today. Um, if you're visiting this morning, you're especially welcome. But my name is Peter Boval. I'm the Presbyterian Minister um, and I'm McGee, but looking after Whitehead in this time. And as we come together to worship God, we do that as a family to worship the King. And that is um, our, our thoughts, our focus this morning, that Jesus is King. If just could flick to the front, we're going to call ourselves to worship. I hope. Or not. It's decided not to work. Oh, we're, we're up. Nobody move. Nobody move. <laughs> I'm going to use some verses from Psalm 24 to call ourselves to worship. A song, a psalm of God's people, a reminder of who it is that they were going to worship, a reminder of us this morning, of who we come to worship. And this is a participation. I'm going to be the leader. And then in the next slide, will be yourselves. I encourage you to join us as we use Psalm 24. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. And it's that King of glory that we come to sing and worship this morning, that King of glory that we come to hear from through his word, and that King that we will speak to as we pray together. And we're going to sing, and if you can, please stand and join us as we sing, the Lord is King, lift up your voice. Let's stand together. <laughs> Psalm 24 that say this. 
Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. But a psalm that reminds us that we know we do not have clean hands, we don't have a pure heart, but as we come to pray to God this morning, we do that through Jesus. So we want to do that. We want to pray together in Jesus' name. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, as we say your words, these words from Psalm 24, we are so mindful that we fall short. Father, we can say that our hands are dirty, our heart is the fire. Unfortunately, we would confess that we do often and do hurt the loved ones that we love. We take advantage of those who show kindness to us. Father, you know our hearts today. But Father, we thank you for Jesus. Because we can ascend the hill of the Lord. We can stand in your holy place because of Jesus. And this morning we want to come together and thank you for the cross. We want to thank you for the price that Jesus paid for how he bore our sin and shame. And we come this morning to declare your amazing grace to us. To thank you for your love for us, for washing us and cleansing us through the blood of Jesus. To be able to bow our heads before you and know that we can be forgiven through him that we have been rescued to worship you, to live for you day by day. Father, our prayer today is that our response to your love is one of showing you abundant love, of living our lives for you, of giving you our lives as living sacrifices. And because, Father, you held nothing back when you gave Jesus as he died for us, Father, we pray that you would move us to hold nothing back as we worship you with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. And Father, as we turn to spend time with you, to spend time with your people this morning, we have come to remind ourselves that Jesus is King, that he is King of the universe, that he is King above all other kings. And we sit with bowed heads, praying, Father, that that would be our stance before you, a humble stance, recognising that you, our King, the one that we will come to serve, to obey, to love above all other things. And so, Father, this morning, move us closer to you, closer to each other as your people in this place, and help us to trust you above everyone and everything else. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just for a few moments, we're going to learn together as a church family. Every time I come and try to do a little section where we can learn together and include any of the kids that are with us this morning. So it's great to have Nika with us this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Brilliant. Now, we're thinking about what it means to trust. And that's quite a big word, maybe, or hard word to understand what it truly means to trust someone. But Nika, I have a wee bit of a question for you this morning, and then I'm going to ask a question to all the adults as well, but when we think about who to trust, who do you go to if you would fall or hurt yourself? Who would you go to? Who would you go to if you fell and hurt yourself? Or who would you go to if you were scared. Huh? Can you think of anybody you might go to? Who would you go to if you were scared? I hope everyone else is answering that question. I might ask at random. But I am sure that Nika might go to. Would you go to your mum or your dad? Not convinced? Okay. <laughs> I think you would. I think if any kids fail and hurt themselves, or if they find themselves somewhere that they were scared, 
they would maybe go to their mum or their dad or a grown up that they knew and that they knew that loved them. And actually that's kind of helping us answer that question, who do we trust? If we would go to someone, if we were hurt or we were scared, or for the adults, if we needed advice about a big problem, or if we were ill and needed help, that person that you think you would go to, I think that's somebody that you trust. That's somebody that you trust. And this morning, for all of us, no matter what age we are, we want to think about trusting God. And we're going to learn a little memory verse together. And Nikki, you're, you, you do some actions with me, would you? Because that'd be all on my own if you didn't. We're going to learn this memory verse. I think a verse that you will know. It's from Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 6. It's this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. So Nikki, you and I are going to do, we're going to do some actions. What do you think? We'll see. Okay, you, you try and follow me. So here's the actions. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. That's always wonderful when some of the congregations do the actions. Feel free to join in. But actions are a great way for all of us to um, remember God's word. So Nika, will we give it a go one last time and see if you can do the actions? All right, here we go. So trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not Lean on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. But it's a verse that encourages us all to trust in God, to look to God when we need help. Even when we're scared or worried or anxious. When life is difficult, that actually we have a relationship with God, that God is the one that we turn to. And that verse encourages us to trust in God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength, not to lean on our own understanding or the understanding of the world, but in all our ways to acknowledge him, to look to him, to thank him and praise him for being with us. And God is faithful. God leads us and guides us as we look to him and one of the ways in which we can trust God is how we listen to his word that if we say that we are trusting in God that as we turn to his word we listen we believe that this is true that this is best for us and there's that encouragement I think they have a slide um gotta put it in yeah slide the last time I said we thought about how we are family we had our Mr. Potato Head, Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head, all, we're all parts of God's family. But God's Word tells us that we are family, that we are to love each other, to look to the good of each other, to pray for each other, to be a family. And as we trust God, we trust in His Word, we believe that this is what's best for us, and we listen and we follow. And that's my encouragement again today to remember that we are family. That's what God's Word tells us. And we want to trust God that this is what's best for us. And so to act in that way, to build relationships with each other, to love each other, to care for each other, to be a family as we gather on a Sunday morning. One other way in which we can recognise that we trust God is the giving of ourselves, the giving of our time, our gifts and our energy, but also of our possessions. And so your offering will now be received as we continue to trust God as we give to him.
Let's pray together. Father, as we give you our offerings and tithes this morning, Father, it is an, an acknowledgement that we trust you, that we recognise all that we have as a gift from you. And so, Father, this morning, even as we worship, we pray, Father, that you would increase our vision of who you are, that you are God and King, that you increase our faith and our trust in you so that we might give more to you, more of who we are, our time, our energy, our, our, our talents, and also that includes our, our possessions. So, Father, we pray that you would bless these gifts with us this morning. We thank you for the generosity that it demonstrates. Um, and we pray, Father, you continue to bless them and use these gifts for your glory in this place. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just some uh, announcements at this time in our, our service. And hopefully during the offering you're maybe watching the slides of announcements and so you've maybe already um, seen some of these and these are just a, a reminder to you if you can please stay um, for tea biscuits um, and coffee after just an opportunity to spend time as a church family this morning. There will be a brief meeting and quick session that will take place after church in the minister's room in the office. Um, so that's just a reminder to Kirk session this morning. As you'll see on the screen also, if you do require the services of a minister, the details, Warren's phone number um, is there. Um, please do contact Warren. And then just um, there's the information about the office home group. Again, if you're in that office home group, we start Monday the 9th, that's tomorrow, 2 p.m. in the church office. Also, just if you're a member of church committee, just that reminder on Wednesday the 11th of September is the next meeting. That's this Wednesday, 7.30 again in the church office. And just note that change of day. That's Wednesday the 11th, um, 7.30 for the church committee. Over the last number of weeks, there's been the announcement about the ladies' evening. Um, that is this Friday night. It's not too late if you haven't already signed up for that. I believe there's a sign-up sheet in the vegetable. Um, there could be nearly 80 ladies joining on Friday night. I'm really looking forward to that. That Well, I'm not because I'm not invited. But all the ladies are really looking forward to that evening. And so if you haven't already signed up, please do sign up. Um, any any gifts, any monies um, that will be raised from that night are going to go to the ongoing youth work in our local area across the three churches. Um, but please do. Um, I suppose that we're encouraging you ladies already know that. Encouraging maybe if you can to share lifts because, um, uh, yeah, there'll be a restricted number of car parking spaces. Um, but, yeah, we look forward to that evening. Every Saturday morning, the prayer meeting continues um, in the Bradley room from 10 a.m. And everyone is most welcome to that and again as Kirk Session already knew um, we're looking for our next meeting on Tuesday the 17th of September at 7.30 um, next Sunday um, and for the next two Sundays Reverend Aaron Diddy who joined you in August is coming along to take the services and then finally the monthly afternoon service that was to take place today it's not taking place today it's being postponed to next Sunday at 4 p.m. Um, and do pass on and invite anyone who, who um, might um, want to come along to that. Thank you for bearing with me through those uh, announcements. I'm going to take some time to consider entering in to the presence of God, to praising our great God. And Wendy's going to come and read some verses from Hebrews that just speak of the privilege that we have of entering into God's presence. And then after Wendy reads, we're going to sing together Thanksgiving. Wendy, thank you. The first reading is from Hebrews chapter 4, beginning at verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but we have one 
He has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And then from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. right before the throne of grace as we pray together but before we we pray i want us to just watch a short um section of a, of a video that's been produced by open doors through the month of september they're encouraging us to pray for christians in africa and so we're going to hear just a little short snippet from a pastor i think in, in nigeria it just reminds us of the, the plight of our brothers and sisters, particularly this month in, in Africa. And then we're going to pray together. We'll pray for others. We'll pray for ourselves and our church family and our, our church family around the world. Uh, and so we're going to watch this, this short two-minute clip um, together. 
let me tell you, here where we are, millions of Christians are displaced here in, in Nigeria. Millions of Christians are displaced in the whole Africa. News don't, take it, don't carry it. Politicians, they don't talk about it. Government don't talk about it. Nobody talks about it. We are remaining in the darkness. As if we are being rejected. As if God don't even know the reason why he created us. We don't even know where we are. This is where we live in RDP camp for four years, getting to five years now. Each and every one you are seeing here, we are all Christians and we are displaced because of violence. Most, you are seeing, uh, most of them are women here now. Most of the men, they have gone out looking for what to do in order to get a daily food, but yet it will not be enough for a meal for a day. And this hunger leads many of them where they went to search of food to eat. And they are being attacked by the, uh, the, by, by, by the militants. They have no option, they have to go back there again. And when going back there, they are still attacked again. They run away. This here, here is my house. Uh, three of them stayed here with me and my wife. Then the rest of the children joined, joined up my neighbor to stay when it's night. When day breaks, they come back and meet with me, stay with me as parents. Uh, this is cardboard that we, we use it in roofing and um, preventing sun from the, 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 for, for preventing us from sun. As you can take a look at this. This tent here is uh, from here to this place is one and a half meters. From here to here is one and a half meters. From here to here is one and a half meters. It's smaller than the, uh, a double uh, mattress. Just a few moments. It just gives us a little bit of an insight um, into the life of displaced Christians in Africa. We want to pray um, for them now. I encourage you maybe to, to consider looking up the Open Doors resources um, during this month as we pray for Africa. But let's pray together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the amazing privilege that we have to come into your presence today. To come in as your children loved by you, knowing, Father, that you are a, a, a heavenly Father who delights to hear our prayers. And so, Father, we want to come now and pray for ourselves and our own families. We want to pray for our church family here in Whitehead. We want to pray for your church family all around the world. But, Father, as we come in the church today, we want to pray for our own families, the families we've maybe left as we've come to church, the families that um, we live with or um, have left our homes. But Father, those closest to us, Father, we thank you that you love them. And as we come maybe to church this morning, we are just anxious for them, worried for them, maybe it's situations that they're going through, challenges that they face. But Father, we want to pray for those closest to us this morning. And we pray, Father, that you help us to trust you. To trust you for their futures, to trust you for the situations that they're going through. 
And pray, Father, that you would work and act and move for their good. Father, we leave them with you. And pray, Father, that each one in each situation, Father, would know your love and your grace and your mercy. And Father, we want to pray for this church family here in Whitehead, for each one, those who can join us on a Sunday morning, those who can't. And we pray, Father, that in these days, that you would be increasing in each one of us a greater love for each other, a greater desire to pray for each other, to know each other, to journey with each other, to spur each other on. Father, that we'd hear that encouragement from Hebrews to not stop meeting together. And that you would bind us together in unity. That you would show us, each one of us, the unique place and part that we play. And that you would encourage us, Father, to use our gifts for you in this place. And Father, as we have just been reminded, that your people, our church, our brothers and sisters right across the world, some, Father, face most difficult situations. We want to pray for those over 16 million Christians who have been displaced by violence and conflict in Africa. Father, it's very hard for us to grasp and understand just what they're going through. But Father, we want to pray for this growing crisis that has led to food insecurity, the trauma, the desperation. Father, we want to pray for provision, for healing, for comfort for our displaced family. Father, as they face Um, attacks from militants. Father, we pray for safety. We pray for hope for the future, Father, that our brothers and sisters would look to you and know, Father, day by day, your care for them, your love for them, and that you would give them hope, your hope for the future. Father, we want to pray, especially for women and and girls who are highly at risk of abduction. Father, we pray, Father, that you would keep them safe. Father, we want to pray for Christian men who maybe head back to seek um, food and and, and, um, their livelihoods have been destroyed. Father, we pray that you would lead them and guide them. But Father, we want to leave our brothers and sisters in Christ, those internally displaced people in your safekeeping this morning and pray father that you would lead us as we seek to pray faithfully for them in the month ahead and so father as we continue to worship you today we pray father that as we turn to your word that you would speak to us that you would build our faith that you would help us to trust in you more and we pray all this in jesus name amen Are you a good storyteller? Are you a good storyteller? I don't count myself as a good storyteller. I think a good storyteller has to be good at delivering the punchline. I'm not very good at delivering the punchline. I get confused in the middle and things don't make any sense. But somebody who's a good storyteller is good at delivering the punchline. And maybe you know someone who is a good storyteller. When I was at university, one of my friends was an excellent storyteller, so much so that after he spent a summer in South Africa, he came back with a story. And this was a story that he recounted again and again. He gathered small groups of friends at university and proceeded to recount a dramatic story of his time in South Africa. He had involved drama, it involved suspense and drove intrigue. He had everyone on the edge of their seats. He dragged it out for about 10 minutes and it came to the final scene on a beach, chasing someone who had stolen his keys and he eventually grabbed them and he said he was pulling their leg. And then came the punchline just like I have been pulling your leg for the last 10 minutes. And everybody sighed and couldn't believe it, but it was a gripping story. Just a pity it wasn't true. But today, we want to hear a true story. 
And sometimes when we read the stories from the Old Testament, maybe we might even be caught believing this actually isn't true. Maybe it didn't actually happen. Maybe they're just stories put in the Bible to be good stories. But this is a true story. Found in Daniel 4, spoken from the lips of King Nebuchadnezzar. And it is indeed an amazing story, a story of drama, of intrigue, of transformation, a story with God right at the heart of it. And we're not going to read the whole of the chapter, but just a middle section that allows us to get a good handle of the whole story. But we join in the middle as Daniel comes to interpret a dream that Nebuchadnezzar has had. So I would love for you to maybe pick up the, the pew Bible in front of you to turn to page 887. Page 887. It's a little bit of a, a longer reading. It's helpful maybe to follow along as I, I read it. But this true story from Daniel chapter 4, we're going to begin at verse actually 19. So it's over the page 888. That's easy. 888 is the page we're looking for. Daniel 4, beginning at verse 19. As we hear God's word, excuse me, to us this morning. Verse 19 of Daniel 4. Then Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Belteshazzar answered, my lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the beasts of the field and having nesting places in its branches for the birds of the air. You, O oh king, are that tree. You've become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky and your dominion extends to distant parts of the earth. You, O king, saw a messenger, a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, cut down the tree and destroy it. But leave the stump bound with iron and bronze in the grass of the field while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live like the wild animals until seven times pass by for him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree, the most highest issue against my lord, the king. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle, be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? The words were still on his lips when a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. 
Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle. Seven times will pass by until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. Amen. If you keep your Bibles open, in a few moments we're going to return to these verses. But before that we're going to stand and say, if you're, you're able to stand, we're going to sing, Lord reign in me. <laughs> possibility of recording TV programs so that we can watch them at a later stage. I think all of us will be able to remember the old video recorder, quite a beast of a thing when it first came out. But now it has become so easy that now you don't even need the right box to record. You just look back and everything is on demand. And in between there are those boxes where you could just record many programs and series all with the press of a button. The challenge that arises if we do get maybe into the habit of recording or looking on on demand and streaming, the challenge that arises, especially if it's an important event, maybe the concluding episode of a series you've been watching or an important sports match the challenge to any of us is to avoid hearing that final score, or hearing how the series concludes before you have that chance to watch it on record. And maybe you avoid listening to the news. Maybe you avoid chatting to people around the lunch table at work. Or maybe the first thing you say to people is, don't tell me how it ended. You don't want to hear the end of the story. You don't want to hear the score of the match because it can ruin everything. Here at the beginning of Daniel chapter 4, we get a little bit of an insight into the end of the story, but I don't think it ruins it for us. It helps us to see the big thing, the big point of this chapter. 
And Nebuchadnezzar himself puts in an introduction in verses 1 to 3. If you have your Bibles, you can look back to verses 1 to 3 of chapter 4. And Nebuchadnezzar begins telling his story by praising God. And then he comes to speak of God's reign and rule. And we read this in the opening verses of chapter 4. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the people, to nations, and men of every language who live in all the world, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure, Nebuchadnezzar says, to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the most high God has performed for me. How great are his signs how mighty his wonders his kingdom is an eternal kingdom his dominion endures from generation to generation that introduction gives us notice that something has happened in king nebuchadnezzar's life because the last number of chapters the early chapters of daniel for our Daniel give glimpses of Nebuchadnezzar turning to the one true God, but never quite getting there. And the last chapter especially spoke of how Nebuchadnezzar was completely wrapped up in himself and his own worship. And yet here, at the beginning of chapter 4, we see a change. We read of Nebuchadnezzar speaking of signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for him. It has become personal. God has intervened in his life. And before we consider exactly what has happened to, to Nebuchadnezzar, I want to make sure that we get the punchline of the story. Unlike that sports result, or unlike the final episode of the drama, we won't, don't want to avoid the big storyline here. We don't want to avoid the reason this chapter is in the Bible and Nebuchadnezzar has already touched on it in the opening verses but just in case we are in any doubt God tells us three times what this story is all about verse 17 from the lips of Nebuchadnezzar verse 25 from the lips of Daniel verse 32 from a voice from heaven Daniel 4 is all about this message a message for Nebuchadnezzar for the nations for the peoples of the earth a message for you and I, that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. That's what the Daniel chapter 4 is all about. The Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. God is king. God is sovereign. God rules and reigns. That's the punchline of this chapter. So what of King Nebuchadnezzar? What has happened to him in this chapter? It begins with a troubling dream. And once, a king, once again, the king is searching for an interpretation. His usual crew of magicians and astrologers are no use. And eventually Daniel, the chief of the magicians, arrives on the scene. And we know that Daniel is no magician. His interpretations, his wisdom come from God, as Nebuchadnezzar alludes to. And so what is the meaning of this dream? As we read that middle section, when Daniel hears the dream, he's actually greatly perplexed and terrified. He knew who this dream spoke of and what it foreshadowed. But with the king's encouragement, he tells the king who the dream is about and what it means. And it's all about God dramatically humbling King Nebuchadnezzar until he acknowledges that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. I don't know if you've watched this movie. I've watched it a while ago now. It's King Arthur Legend of the Sword. 
There have been many movies that have been produced based on the legends around King Arthur. But the core of the plot of this movie was how King Arthur dies. And after that, his brother tries to take the throne by force. And his brother then takes the place of the rightful king, who was Arthur's son. His brother sits on a throne that wasn't his to sit on. And not only does the brother sit on the throne that wasn't his, he takes the power, he takes the possessions, he takes the privilege of being king. He took the glory, he took the honour, the adulation, the worship that also wasn't his to take. King Nebuchadnezzar was a proud man. And his greatest sin is taking upon himself the glory that only God deserved. Verse 29 and 30, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, is not this the great Babylon I have built? Nebuchadnezzar is saying, look at what I have done. I deserve all the glory. How great am I? And in Nebuchadnezzar's mind and world, he was the king. He had taken God's place in the throne. And God will not give his glory to anyone or anything else. And Nebuchadnezzar had been warned. He'd been warned to renounce his sin and wickedness, to do what is right, to be kind to the oppressed. He had been encouraged to acknowledge that God was king. However, he didn't heed. The warning. And if we return to the movie King Arthur, as with all good stories, King Arthur's son returns. He removes Excalibur, the king's sword that was entrenched in a stone. He returns to rescue the kingdom, to kill his uncle, to rightfully sit on the throne as king. And God has come. And Daniel 4 to teach Nebuchadnezzar who is really king. To humble him in the most dramatic of ways. He loses his mind. He's driven from the people to eat grass like an ox. He lives in the fields, grows hair like the feathers of an eagle, nails like the claws of a bird. He becomes like an animal. As Nebuchadnezzar says on his own lips later on in verse 37, those who walk in pride, God is able to humble. God is king. And as we read at the beginning of the chapter, we read again at the end of verse 34, God's dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. God is king of all peoples over all countries and king forever. So this is the, the truth that we find in Daniel 4, the truth that we want to grapple with in our individual lives today. And the truth speaks into our lives in, in different ways. It encourages us to pray. It encourages us to pray for the world in which we live. And there are so many situations that, that can cause us to lose hope, to struggle to see a way forward or a solution. There are so many difficult situations around the world that are so vast in scale beyond our comprehension, situations of war and famine, corruption, natural disaster. But the reminder from Daniel 4 is, over all these things, God is king. Over this world, over all peoples, over all countries, over all governments, and when we pray, just like we were doing a little bit earlier in the service, we are praying to the king who can answer our prayers, who can move in government, who can humble the proud and bring hope. And so we find hope, hope for situations around the world, hope for our nation and country, hope for our individual lives as well. Because sometimes there are situations in our individual life where we feel there is no hope, there is no way forward. Just 
yesterday on the BBC news site I read this that the world order under threat not seen since the Cold War and so this is day after day it's quite a statement and I wonder how does that make you feel where's the hope in our world, when there's war in Ukraine, Gaza, Myanmar, Sudan, Nigeria, to name just a few, political uncertainty, rising racism, our world is a turbulent place. But our hope is in God. God is our ultimate hope, not politicians or governments. Christ remains on the throne as an in charge and our hope is in Jesus. There's often great challenge and uncertainty in political circles. And sometimes we don't know how we can play our part, what God calls us to. But I read this at one point, something for just from the Evangelical Alliance. And it just reminds us of our calling in the midst of all that's going on. It said this, that our calling was to remain faithful to our calling as a church. And as disciples of Jesus, to speak truth, to model grace and mercy, to do justice, to love our neighbour, to speak, to seek peace and prosperity of our province, to go after the least and the lost and to walk humbly with our God. In the midst of all that's going on in the world around us, in our community, in our society, God is King and we're called to walk humbly with our God, to put our hope in Him. And in finishing, we bring the, the challenge to our front doors, into our own lives. God is king but can you say this morning that he is your king king nebuchadnezzar was humble to the point of being an animal so that he might acknowledge that god was king but that great transformation comes to a conclusion in verse 34 at the end of that time i nebuchadnezzar raised my eyes towards heaven and my sanity was restored then I praised the Most High, I honoured and glorified him who lives forever. Nebuchadnezzar turned to God. He acknowledged that God was king. And we must all hear Daniel's words to Nebuchadnezzar earlier in the chapter in our day-to-day -day lives. Recognizing that God is king, Nebuchadnezzar was encouraged, renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It's that challenge for all of us. How in my life, how maybe in your life, do you take the glory that only belongs to God? In our accomplishments, in the blessings that we experience from God in our successes, do we praise ourselves or do we thank God? Is Jesus on the throne of my life? Is he directing my life? Am I trusting in him? Or am I sitting pretty on that throne, making the calls? Because my natural tendency is to sit on the throne. It's, I think, the same for all of us. We can so easily take the praise when things are going well. We can pat ourselves on the back. We can forget about God's hand in and on our lives. I can be slow to give thanks and praise to God. But we don't want to reach a point when we are humbled by God. Instead, we want to humble ourselves before our God day by day. To humble ourselves. And when we consider humility, Jesus is the greatest example to us. Our example of a king who died for us. Just as we bring our service to a close, as we consider all that God wants to say to us this morning, I want to read some verses from Philippians chapter 2 that give us that example. 
of Christ's humility and how we might follow in Jesus' footsteps of humbling ourselves before our King and seeking to serve him. This is what we read in Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let's pray before we, we close our service in song. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for that clear central truth of Daniel 4 that you are king. That your dominion is an eternal dominion. Your kingdom endures from generation to generation. Father, this morning, may we recognise that amazing truth in our lives, personally. Father, just like Nebuchadnezzar came to that personal realisation that you are king. He humbled himself before you. Father, I pray that day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment, that we are humbling ourselves before you recognizing that you are God, that you are king, that we are taking ourselves off the throne of our lives, putting Jesus there and seeking to live for him. <coughs> Father, we thank you that there is hope in our lives, in our world, because you are king. And not only are you that king who rules and reigns, who has power and majesty and deserves all the glory, Father, you're the God, the king who loves us, who has shown us the most amazing grace and mercy, who welcomes us before your throne of grace, who wants to bring that mercy and grace into our lives in those times of need. And so, Father, today, may we trust in you as king of our lives, look to you and find hope today. Father, as we close our service, may the words of the song be a prayer from our hearts. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing King of Kings.
just as we close our services, Jason would flick back to the front. That would be great. I want to invite you to read some <laughs> verses from Psalm 62, just as a, a prayer for each other, a benediction as we close our service, as we look to God. Let's say these verses and pray for each other and commit each other to God as we close our service. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I shall never be shaken. Find rest, O oh my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. And the people of God said, Amen.